one day it occurred to me that our best guy, who I called Fred, was making about a hundred grand thereabouts. And he was really fast. He got things done right the first time. So he would blow through projects very quickly. And on the other end of the spectrum, we had a junior guy that I call Barney. And he was not fast. He was the opposite of fast. He needed a lot of coaching and he had to do work over and over again. And it was all billable. So we were making tons of money off of Barney, who was our junior guy, and you know, less money from our best guy because he was really fast and he cost twice as much salary wise from the junior guy. So it occurred to me that if if I was going to let someone go for some reason, I would have to let go of our best guy, which made I was just like, no, we're lucky to have this guy. He could go work anywhere he wants. What could your business be like if you were no longer chained to the billable hour? Do you think your business model is even possible without the billable hour? Does making the leap away from hourly billing sound terrifying, stupid, suicidal even? This week, we're joined by Jonathan Stark, a former software developer who is on a mission to rid the world of hourly billing. He wrote, Hourly Billing is Nuts, hosts the Ditching Hourly podcast, and writes a daily newsletter on pricing for independent professionals. We've talked about the importance of being an expert in previous episodes and how it's ultimately less risky than being a generalist. In this episode, we'll expand on that and how offering fixed prices positions you as the expert who's seen this before. Fixed pricing will help differentiate you and your work and avoid a race to be the cheapest option to a client. We'll also talk about the three important questions you need every new potential client to answer. Why this? Why now? And why me? This only scratches the surface of our discussion. I'm a big fan of Jonathan's work, and I really hope you stay with us till the end. This chat could literally change the way you run your business. I'm John Strohmeyer, and this is the Five Star Council Podcast. The market for legal services is shifting, and lawyers who don't adapt will be left behind. This podcast gives you a competitive edge in today's market by sharing the client service lessons you probably didn't learn in law school or in law practice. Let's start the show. Hey, five-star listeners. Before we start, I want to tell you about our amazing sponsor, Smith AI. Smith AI is a virtual receptionist service for small businesses with a specialty in working with solo and small law firms. I signed up with them within weeks of starting my firm because they are affordable for even the smallest solo practice. Their friendly receptionists respond to potential clients in Spanish or English, screen and schedule new leads, and can even take payments. And now they're answering calls 24 hours a day. So even when you're asleep, they're still working. Even beyond the phone, they've got live agents and chatbots ready to capture leads on your website, by text, and by Facebook Messenger. Smith's friendly gatekeepers can staff your front line so you can work uninterrupted. You can finally have the peace of mind that while you're working, you're not missing out on future work. Plans start at just $70 a month for calls and $100 a month for chats. Smith AI is offering a free trial, and our podcast listeners get an extra $100 discount code with promo code 5 star. That's F I V E S T A R. Sign up and learn more at www.smith.ai. Don't let another day go by. Try Smith AI. Hey, Jonathan, it is great to have you here today. Thanks for having me. And I realize I say that on every episode, but honestly, it really is, you know, it really is great to have you here today. (laughs) So I have been listening to your podcast. You have self-branded as the hourly billing is nuts guy. I have taken a lot of great lessons from you in my own practice to rid myself from the billable hour. Mm -hmm. I've done a pretty good job. I still have a few things where I haven't gotten rid of it completely. And so today is kind of the shared private coaching session of Do I need to either get rid of those? Do I need to uh, just say that's pricing for the ignorance of my own? But really, it's sharing a lot of what you've shared in other places and letting me get you to tell it to me straight here. And so hourly billing is nuts. Nobody likes it. How did you first figure this out? Oh, okay. That's uh, that goes back to 2005, I guess, is when it was when it happened. I was managing a small firm we did. It was like a boutique software development firm. We happened to use FileMaker, and we were really well-known, had about 10 developers, and we billed everybody out at a blended rate of $150 an hour. And one day, it occurred to me that our best guy, who I called Fred, was making about 100 grand thereabouts, 
and he was really fast. He got things done right the first time. So he would blow through projects very quickly. And on the other end of the spectrum, we had a junior guy that I call Barney, and he was not fast. He was the opposite of fast. He needed a lot of coaching and he had to do work over and over again. And it was all billable. So we were making tons of money off of Barney, who was our junior guy, and you know, less money from our best guy because he was really fast and he cost twice as much salary wise from the junior guy. So it occurred to me that if if I was going to let someone go for some reason, I would have to let go of our best guy, which made, I was just like, no, we're lucky to have this guy. He could go work anywhere he wants. And I just couldn't, I couldn't rectify that in my mind. We're just, the, like the junior guy was way more profitable, like dramatically more profitable, which didn't seem fair to the clients. And it just, it blew my mind. I was just, it was this puzzle that I had in the back of my mind for weeks before it finally occurred to me that if we were giving fixed project prices, Fred would immediately be the best employee, not just in terms of skills, but in terms of profitability. And I just, I could not unsee that. I had to do something about it. Yeah, effectively, you were getting punished by using Fred and being rewarded by using Barney. And mm -hmm. the yeah, exactly. confluence of those names just hit me as I... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that I'm sure that had nothing to do with your upbringing or your favorite <laughs> cartoons My growing up. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, and that's the problem. You know, you come from the software development background uh, world. Mm -hmm. We're talking here mostly to lawyers where the problem is rarely the value delivered, but it's linking up the value with what's being paid because the work we do being both of us, whether it's soft, turning the needle on software development moving the needle as a lawyer, the better you get at it, the hourly billing model is going to end up just punishing you for it. Yeah, it punishes expertise because with it punishes productivity, it punishes optimization. Why would you even buy a faster computer? You know, in a software development world, there's, you know, you compile software and it can take time and you have to babysit it. So why would you upgrade your computer, you know, spend five grand on a really fast machine to lose money? Like the incentives are just completely messed up. It doesn't make sense. Right. And at this point, we can talk about how crazy it is and folks are either going to be on board or not. And so rather than belabor the why this is actually useful, mm -hmm. I think it's better to start getting into, well, there are pitfalls in getting started in this. And we're going to mm -hmm. assume everybody w would rather be in the mindset of let's start, start having fixed pricing. Mm hmm because that way we can start getting the benefits from this. And one of the things I've heard you say before is your formula, it's not an exact formula, which will drive everybody crazy, but the mindset of the formula is the price isn't just the desire to pay multiplied by a client's ability to pay. Because then, you know, if I deliver a million dollar value to somebody, we're taking it in the vacuum of I can do this. And so as long as I don't charge you more than 999,000, you're still getting a deal. Mm -hmm. You've added a term where you're dividing everything by the availability of options. And I think this is an important thing to think about as we start coming up with what these first prices are. Can you say a little bit more about that? Sure. I call that my max price formula. And it, it's, it is not an exact formula, but it is a framework for thinking about the maximum price you could charge, or which is another way of saying the value to a particular client. So if you've got, I, I usually, you know, it's like desire times money divided by options just to, so it's easy to remember for listeners. And the desire is they need to want the, the outcome that you can provide. They need to want what you have. So it, that could be access to expertise. It could be a Rolex watch. It doesn't matter what you're selling. If they want it, they want it. It's not what they need. It's what they want. Lots of people need things that they don't want, you know, whatever we could go into a list of that, but you want there needs to be high level of desire for whatever you're offering. In your case, it might be access to expertise. It might be a transformation. It might be a, a big settlement, whatever it is, they need to want it really bad. Then, like you said, ability to pay or buying power or just budget money. How much money do they have? If they only have $10, they can't pay you more than $10. You know, if they can't get access to credit or if they can't get a loan or funding or something, that's it. That's, I mean, it doesn't matter how badly they want it. You know, I might want a McLaren. I'm not going to go buy one. You know, actually, I don't want a McLaren. But anyway, more of a Subaru Outback type of guy. Fair. So 
So they have to have that, those two things. I think that's probably pretty apparent, but the availability of options is this. If they can't tell the difference between, you know, this Rolex and that Rolex or this Rolex and Paul Newman's Rolex or, you know, uh, whatever. If they can't tell the difference between two things, and obviously we're talking about two different law firms. If they can't see a meaningful difference between law firm A and law firm B, they're going to go with the cheaper one. Of course they are. The problem is that firms of all kinds, because I work with all sorts of different people, different kinds of businesses, all hourly billers generally, they see the differences between, you know, law firm A and law firm B. So if you're law firm A, you'd be like, oh, we're way better than law firm B. Why can't everyone just see that? Well, they can't. You might know that you've got a better record or you might know that you had a better GPA in law school or graduated from a better school. The average buyer is not an expert of any of those things. They can't detect those differences. And even if they can detect them, they might not be meaningful. There need to be meaningful, and I mean to the buyer, there needs to be meaningful differences between option A and option B. If there are no meaningful differences between the two firms, they will always go with the cheapest one. Or if there are three on the table, they'll go with the second cheapest one. <laughs> they think <laughs> the cheapest one's the like actually bad. So yeah, so it, it turns into a positioning exercise. If people, if you're target market, your ideal buyers, your typical kinds of clients doesn't do not see a meaningful difference between you and the next guy, then you're in or gal, then you're going to be in a race to zero full stop. There's that's, that's it. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's so interesting because I do a lot of work in estate planning and the thought is always, well, this is indistinguishable. People are going to show up. They can't tell the difference. Plus they're always going to start with the assumption. My estate plan is simple this isn't going to be hard for you. So they are just shopping on price. And what we've seen is the people who are shopping on price really don't benefit from working with us and vice versa. You know, the pricing we have is meant to get us out of that range. But it's also, I mean, I, I'll admit I've been thinking of the availability of options just selfishly from my own view. Mm -hmm. Because, oh, well, look, you know, if there are 15 people in the country who can do work that I do, that's one thing. But if the clients can't recognize that I'm one of 15 or know when to pick up the phone and call me because I'm one of the 15, mm -hmm. it's looking at it and making sure you can exhibit your differentiation, mm -hmm. which is another way of saying, can you market yourself well? Right, right. You need to be perceived as the go-to expert for something. And that usually, almost always, means specializing or niching way down on a particular target market. It's some combination of those two things is the easiest way to easiest way to stand out from the crowd. You don't want to be just one of many. You want to be the one and only. And to become the one and only law firm writ large makes no sense. You're never going to do that. It's probably impossible. There's probably not even one. Like even if there is a best one, it's it's going to change in every different person's mind. In order to be the, you want to be a big fish in a small pond, not a big fish or even or a small fish in the ocean. Like every fish in the ocean is small. You want to be a big fish in a small pond. If you, you probably only need, I mean, a thousand clients. A, I mean, could you even handle a thousand clients a year? No. I mean, I, I think, I mean, looking back, my firm has had 350 clients over the last three years, just off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. And we're growing. That is good news. Mm -hmm. But if you told me to 10x that, I would never see the inside of my eyelids again. <laughs> right. So if you if you said 100 clients a year is as many as you can handle, let's just say that's your capacity or someone's capacity, then, you know, what is it? Uh, 100 times 100, 1,000, 10,000? Right. <laughs> On the spot, I'm not good with math. It's not a million. It's not 100 million. It's a very small number. The addressable, the market that you need to address, if you only want to capture, you know, 1% or 10%, it's only a few thousand people, right? Of the uh, so if you could specialize on a niche that only contains professional fly fishermen. And do you think if you specialized in something that specific, you could differentiate yourself from every other estate planner out there? Yes. You could show up you could show up to meetings with waiters on and they would fall in love with you, right? I mean just a I mean I'm, I'm barely kidding. Your whole no, website I, could be about fish. You're absolutely right and I'll tell you one of the things that I've done the the easiest thing I've done to stand apart in the minds of future clients is having the website that isn't the most you know morose and serious website. It doesn't set me apart technically, but mentally the clients know, oh, this is a guy who may make jokes. They, you know, they're, he's going to have some level of fun with it. 
And he's also listed his dogs as employees. Mm -hmm. Does it get to my technical expertise? No. I mean, clearly I'm not having my dogs draft anything. They're just here for (laughs) answering the phone and making copies. Clearly. Clearly. (laughs) What do they get an hour? (laughs) You know, treats. They get treats. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't fail that once a month or so, I get a client who will say, you know, we, we were down to you and somebody else and you had your dogs on your website and we knew you were the guy for us. Mm-hmm. So if anything, I'm lining up on a more like humanitarian personality wise in a sea of indistinguishable skills and abilities. Mm-hmm. We're not, you know, taking away the the fact that my website photos don't have me in a tie looking very grim and somber mm-hmm. yeah. and putting it in there and also, you know, addressing my website to the clients and not to other attorneys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had a conversation with someone who is in the CPA space, and we kind of brainstormed a positioning for a CPA, which I feel like they're in a similar kind of boat with you. It's It tends to be pretty buttoned down, a little morose, very risk averse. So what? imagine if you were looking for a CPA, you and the dear listener, imagine if you were looking for a CPA, and you came across someone in like full leather gear, for like a Harley person, full leather gear, t-shirt, and they were like the forensic bounty hunter. So we we went back and forth. It was like, what could you do that would instantaneously set you apart from every other CPA on planet Earth? I bet you there's not one CPA on planet Earth that bills themselves as the forensic bounty hunter and dresses like they just got back from Sturgis. So what do you think? How many people went to Sturgis? 400,000 in a given year? It's like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. I'll bet you a some lot. of them. Yeah. And they all have 20, 30, 40, $50,000 motorcycles. So they've got budget. There's tons of them. There's way more than you could service. So it's actually not risky. It's I think it's it's safer to focus on a smaller target market, get out of your comfort zone. It's it's less risk, honestly. It's almost it seems paradoxical. Like if I cast a, a wider net, I'll catch more fish. That's not true. It's it's the opposite of true. Right. And so then when we start thinking about it as dropping the hourly billing option, it's another way of setting yourself apart because if you're going to be perceived as the expert, Mm -hmm. you've got to, you know, you're the person who is going to be the Sherpa to the client, getting Mm -hmm. them up the mountain. Mm -hmm. You're the one who's been there and done it before. Mm -hmm. And the way you communicate that we've done this before is we know what to charge you. We know what to expect. And even if there are certain risks, we're going to price that into our price. Mm -hmm. Yeah. New clients who probably aren't constantly buying legal services, right? Right. They, it's perfectly reasonable you might, you know, the seller, the lawyer might think this is unreasonable, but I think it's perfectly reasonable for a buyer to come along and say, well, if you're such an expert, how come you don't know how much it's going to cost? Right. And you and I both know that it's more complicated than that, but does it have to be? You know, I don't think it has to be. I think that there, I come, you know, software development is famous, famous for scope creep. It's famous for going over budget. I think, you know, there's a study I read, it's probably, you know, a little older now, but my experience in the industry aligns with it which something like 50% of IT projects go more than double over the estimated initial budget. And you have to start to ask yourself, like, like, how can it be that bad? Like something must be wrong systemically, you know? And I'm a, an example, I have a bunch of private coaching students that are all examples of people who have taken this thing that is wildly underestimated, a software project, and they give fixed prices for them and they're super profitable but they're not giving the same fixed price that they would have if they were just giving an estimate because the estimates are always lowballed. They're always lowballed, whether on purpose or by accident, they're always low. So that's why it always happens. So when someone comes along and is willing to stand behind a price for a six month or a 12 month long software build, or I don't know, some extended trial or something like that, and, and stand behind your price, just like you said, you're projecting yourself as an expert. You know what you're doing. And even if it turns out that, you know, in your mind, you probably have some idea of how long the undertaking is going to be. Even if you're wrong, your price was way higher. So you're still fine. Your price was way higher than everybody else's. So you're like, yeah, this was, it took it took eight months instead of six. Big deal. They paid us a, an extra zero more than we would have estimated by the hour. Right. And this is the, you know, the, the part where people get nervous. And I know from my own experience getting and setting prices, it was scary the first few times. Mm-hmm. And then I've developed it almost into, you know, one, there's a ladder of pricing. And I know you've talked about this as well. And there's probably more than enough for to even go into that. <laughs> but presenting the options to the client, because 
legal ethics requires that or across the country, mm-hmm. lawyers are here to help clients achieve their ends in different states, spell it out in different ways. The problem is, and what I've what helped it click in my mind was we had to put more of the control back in the client's hands. And part of the way we do that is setting up pricing tiers so that, you know, again, one, you mentioned this earlier, they're not going to pick the cheapest option. They're going to pick the second cheapest. But I mean, even, well, of course, they're people of culture and taste, but they're, they're not made of money. <laughs> but, you know, we, we come in and we say, all right, well, look, I know what the best, most superlative level of planning is, but you may not need that. You may not want that. Mm-hmm. And it's a lot easier for me to say, here's low tier, medium tier, high tier. Mm-hmm. I can, you know, once I've then priced those out, it's easy for me to say, look, even at the low tier, I'm making money and I'm not going to be upset at that price. Mm-hmm. Because why? I've reduced the amount of input that it takes from me. You know, we're not going to do over the top trust that lasts for, you know, as long as time will last. We're <laughs> saying you're you're making the choice that, when, uh, for me personally, when we're doing that, the trusts end at age 25 and they get it. And if they blow it on Maseratis and Fabergé eggs, that is the choice you have made. You have traded the risk of that happening uh, for, for a, a certain price. Yeah. Right. And if you would like to trade away some of that risk, we can, you know, for mm-hmm. for additional dollars, we will do this. Mm-hmm. That's 100%. I just had a, an example of that where I was talking to, I was looking for a service. It's, it's unrelated to any of this, but I was looking for a service to hire. And I talked to two different people and there was one that was clearly higher quality, but it was also roughly double the price. And it was more than I needed. It was just more than I needed. Like they, I'm sure they do a great job. I know they do a great job, but it was just more than I needed. So I picked the more bare bones one, which just got me where I needed to be, you know, and the other provider is positioned in my mind as the higher quality one. And if I ever do need that in the future, I will call them. But not having that option takes power away from the the customer or the client, as you said. Right, and it's you know there's some there's probably a deeper level of the IKEA effect that's in there, but it's not just them coming in, forking over money, and passively accepting whatever we've got. Mm-hmm. They're involved in this is what it looks like. This is what we're creating together. Right, and you can have a really clear conversation about the different risks because it's, ex, you know, it's exposed in your options, you know, like, well, what's the difference between option one and two? And it's like the risk, right? <laughs> right. So that you can have a conversation with them and, and talk through the pros and cons in a context that they will be able to understand. Right. So yeah, so it exposes the risk factor. That's why, you know, when we do software proposals, I always recommend three options. Give the client three options. It it protects you from leaving too much money on the table. Like if you just gave an ultimatum style proposal with one number, that's it. It protects you from leaving money on the table and it allows them to pick a price that that makes sense in the context of a set of prices. People are horrible at detecting or or putting a, uh, an exact number on a value in a vacuum. But when they say th- see three prices together, they immediately gravitate to one of the dollar amounts and then they start asking questions about, well, what do I get for, you know, the, uh, you know, what's the difference between the tiers? So they're thinking about how, which way to work with you, how to work with you instead of should I work with you or should I shop this around and see if somebody else has a better deal? Got it. it so, I mean, in terms of those pricing, how do you even come up with the values? It's, I mean, it's not it's just as simple as one, client. two, three. No, it's it's a it's a process. It's a collaborative process with the client. You need to uncover through conversation what their desired outcome is, and you know this is an art. This is not a science. So you discuss with them what they're trying to achieve. You know how can I help? You came into my office. How can I help? They obviously think they need a lawyer, but maybe they don't. So you want to find out what their desired outcome is and get a sense of what that's worth to them. And I, I have a, a sort of framework for for doing that. I call it the why conversation. But you know, there are plenty of people who have talked about this kind of thing, Socratic questioning and value conversations and so forth. But basically, you're just asking them why questions. Why do this? Why not not do this? Like, what's right. the risk? You don't have to pay your taxes. They'll just be consequences. You know, it's a choice. So uh, you just go through this list of questions. And you start to understand what they really want, the underlying desire. So in your estate planning situation, what are they afraid of? They're afraid their, you know, grandchildren are going to destroy their legacy or whatever the underlying thing is. 
and you get a sense of what it's worth. I mean, you know, I, I suppose in an estate planning situation, you pretty much know how much money they have. Like, you know, the buying power situ- part of it. And you could come up with some kind of three tiers potentially of service that uh, that differ on could be on risk, could be on of access to you availability, depending on the kind of engagement it is, could be, you know, how much uh, oversight you're going to provide. There's a, there are a bunch of ways to do it. And I'm not super familiar with like, I'm, I'm sure there's a million different kinds of law. I know there are. So it would be different from case to case, but it all boils down to the same thing. What is the client trying to achieve? What is the transformation that they want to make? Either it's it could be something fairly intangible, like they're just awake at night and they want to stop being awake at night worrying about this thing. Or it could be something more tangible, like, I don't know, they're getting audited or they're in a lawsuit or they're breaking up with their business partner or wife or whatever. And the specifics are going to be different every single time. And if you're going to value price, which is what we're talking about, you need to reverse engineer your scope of work, your cost, your scope of work from what it's worth to them. So if it's worth $100,000 to Bob, then you can't present a price that's more than $100,000. He's not going to say yes. But you can present a price that's ten thousand, and you can present a price that's twenty-two thousand, and you can present a price that's fifty thousand, and then ask yourself, okay, how can I help Bob get closer to that goal for ten thousand dollars and be happy getting paid that much? So you right. don't think about what you're going to do first; you think about it last after you have a price. Right. And what I'm picking up between the lines on this is you may have kind of a scale of prices, mm-hmm. but you don't have that price until you've talked to them. You know. There may be on certain levels where you can just say, look, if you fit within this box, we already know what the pricing is. That would be a productized service. So right. um, I'm talking about a custom project. So if you have a custom project that doesn't fit into a box and you do want to work with the client and you have to come up with a proposal, I would call that a, a custom project proposal and I would value price that. Right. Mm-hmm. But if you do have, you know, if you do have services that fit in a box, that's a perfect way to put it. You can put it in a package that has a label and it explains what's inside and the benefits. And on the back, there's a list of ingredients, like all the stuff you're going to do. Then you can put a price tag on it. And when the right person comes along, they'll just buy it. They might not even right. need to talk to you. Right. It, it just making it easy. And so even then, because a lot of the legal work ends up being more of the customized project. You know, it's like there are no two clients that are the same because there are no two facts that are the same, but certain things rhyme and you've done some of this before. So you know roughly what will be involved Mm -hmm. and then figuring out based on, you know, what knobs are turned to which direction when the client walks in the door, Mm -hmm. how to price it for them. Right. Yep. And also I don't, we probably, I don't know if we, I'd be happy to talk about it if you have time, but I think another model that makes tons of sense for my understanding of lawyers uh, as a subscription model. I mean, my doctor, I have a concierge doctor. I'm subscribed to my doctor and I can call him night and day. I can email him. I can text him 24-7, 365 days a year. And guess guess what? I see him once a year, my annual physical, and that's it. In 10 years, I have only contacted him twice outside of my physical. And I pay 1500 bucks a month for that. Uh, sorry, a year, not a month. That would be a lot. <laughs> that would be a lot. 1500 bucks a year to be a member of his practice. And I still have fees on top of it when I go, you know, like blood tests and stuff like that. But you know, it's just like, that's the price of membership. And I can call him whenever, but I, but it's the peace of mind I want. I want to know that I can call him. Right. I would, I wish my lawyer did that. Yeah. You want, I mean, and if anything, the subscription model, which is, I mean, it is making its way through legal. There are, I mean, I've been experimenting with it for years, trying to figure out what that looks like, because there are clients who want to say, call my lawyer. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have one client who's been with me for oh, God, five or six years at this point on subscription. And it is something I get texts in the middle of the night sometimes. What do we do about this? Can you talk to the CPA? Can you do this or that or the other? Mm-hmm. And then there are also times where nothing happens for a month or two. Mm-hmm. And right. on par, they're happy with what, what happens because they know I'm there. And they also, you know, I will show up at their house to have documents signed. Wow. That would be because amazing. I, that would be amazing. Exactly. I mean, and that's even in the land of COVID, in the land of electronic signing. Mm-hmm. There are still reasons to do things with ink and paper, but they are paying for that level. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the, met, you know, one of the metrics, not the right thing. Benefits. Scalers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
on which we can differentiate ourselves. And it's yeah. been, you know, one of the nice things about COVID has been I'm much more willing to drive to a client's house because I'm not, you know, I'm mostly working from home now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when it does come time to sign something, I'm willing to get in the car and drive even the half out, half an hour across Houston to get mm -hmm. to a client's house because I don't have to get in the car and drive to my office five days a week. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the way the subscription thing works and the, the tricky part of it is that you need to spread the risk out across your basic clients. So if you do get a time vampire who just wants to chat with you all the time, then that's balanced out by the fact that, you know, 90% of the people barely ever contact you. So, and by the way, you can let the time vampire go or put them in touch with somebody who'd be a better fit. So it's just not, I mean, I'm sure every lawyer listening is a brilliant conversationalist, but I don't believe that your clients want to hang out on the phone with you or just no. have you come over to deliver paperwork so they can say hi and chat. They have other things to do. And assuming that you're attracting, you know, that you also have control over who you attract client wise. So, you know, if you go back to the Harley idea, like we, you know, I do estate planning for people that, that for Harley people, they're, they're going to be a type. It's like you said, everybody's different, but there are types. You're going to be able to relate to them. You're going to know right away when you talk to somebody who's in this group that you are also a member of, let's say, you're going to get a sense right away of the kind of person they are. I mean, if you've been in business for a few years, like you can tell, you know, if somebody's going to be super needy, for example, and then just just point them at a better option for them because they're not a good option for your like subscription service. So I, I think it's such an advisory thing, profession. It's such an advisory profession. And the way that my doctor works, it's actually very advisory too. He, he, other than my physical, he doesn't actually do anything for me. He sends me to specialists if I need anything. Right. So, right. So I just need, I just want the peace of mind. Should I come into the office for this rash or should I just put some lotion on it? Not that I get rashes, but just as an example. Right. It's if a piece if of you mind were thing. a person who, you know, lived such a heathen lifestyle that you were to get a rash. Exactly. I haven't had a rash in a while. I have two little kids, though, and they right. get rashes sometimes. And I need to know, should I worry about this? Right. You want to know that you're going to get the right answer quickly and you're going to be heard. Mm -hmm. You're not going to have to wait in line. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you text him in the middle of the night, I'm sure he sleeps like the rest of us. So it may take you six or eight hours to get something if you time it incorrectly. He has an answer service though. And it, it, that has never, that would be a severe emergency and I would probably just go to the emergency room. Right. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, normal business hours, if I've ever, on the couple of occasions I've contacted him, it's been like, come in right now. You know, if you feel like you need a checkup or whatever, like one time I had the flu really bad, so I wasn't going to come in right then. But he told me, you know, have your wife go get this, that, and the other. And you know, that'll, that'll help. And yeah. And, and so ultimately, he knows what his primary practice, I mean, it sounds like he's a primary care physician. He's yes. acting as that primary point of contact. Mm -hmm. He's just going to triage what you need. Right. And if he can't answer it quickly, he's sending you to the person who can do it well. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, like I had this issue with uh, something with my foot uh, mm -hmm. a few months ago. I went to my primary care physician who also does sports med. Oh. He looked at it and was like, I can do this but I don't normally do this where you need it in your foot. Do you want me to try or do you want a referral elsewhere? And I was like, no, 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 no. send me to the specialist, send me to the person who puts that needle mm -hmm. in my foot in the particular <laughs> place in my foot that I need it. Yeah. You know, like, mm -hmm. I like you a lot, but <laughs> send me somewhere else to somebody who does it, you know, like don't dabble in putting those needles in my foot. Mm -hmm. So I talk about these subjects all the time and I've, there are lots of examples that come to mind. And there was one that really stands out where I had a, a person on my, I do this daily mailing list where I, I talk about pricing for professionals. And one of the people was, he uh, fell off his bike. One of the people on my list fell off his bike and was telling a story to the group about how he was sent to a specialist is wasn't getting better his shoulder and his wrist and everything. So he, they sent him to this specialist uh, who I, I think was a orthopedic. I can't remember, but they, they were, they specialized in like just general joint stuff. And he went there, had some treatments, nothing, nothing worked. His doctor said, well, there's a specialist who's, who just does from the bone problems or like joint problems from the wrist to the tips of the fingers. They specialize in that single piece of the body. And he went to them and they had his wrist better in like three weeks, like some very quick amount of time. And previously it was just not getting better. And he said, you guys are amazing. Can you help me with my shoulder? And they said, no, we don't do shoulders. And 
he wrapped up the story by saying that the place that's specialized in just the hand that actually got him results was slammed, very busy. This is a couple of years ago, pre-COVID. They were slammed with business and he noticed that the one that was just a generalist for all of the joints of the body was not as busy. So, you know, in the, the hand people demonstrated their commitment to their specialization by saying no to work. That's a key feature of a lot of these things. And I got talking about it because of subscriptions. You will say no to people. You don't, you're not going to take every client who comes over the transom. You won't need to. You're going to take the ones that are the best fit for you that you know you can deliver the best results for and the ones that are going to respect your boundaries and all of those things too. So yeah, if you set some boundaries for yourself, you stand for something, you become known as the one and only for a particular thing, like just a, you know, a hand, just a hand surgeon, then you will stand out and you'll start to attract more leads with a, by casting a smaller net. It seems impossible, but that's the way it works. This morning I had a phone call with a new potential client. They'd already been screened by my folks. It looked like it was something we could help them with pretty easily. And the more I started peeling back the layers of the onion, there was just this looming mess underneath. And it was not the type of mess I would like to untangle. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it, it took 45 minutes to get them to the point where I was like, I don't think I'm the best person. You are probably going to end up needing somebody to go file things in court for you. Mm -hmm. And I am not a lawyer who likes to go to court. Mm -hmm. So getting them off the phone and just say, look, I, I need to find you a better specialist. Mm -hmm. I could help, but you're going to get a better person somewhere else. Let me find you that person. Right. And get them taken care of. And it, yeah. it again, it, it all comes back, you know, to the pricing of if you know what you're doing, like I, I would then end up having to price that client for my ignorance. If I gave them a flat fee, like I would want to, mm -hmm. I'm risking being way out of line, either way too high, mm -hmm. which has its benefits of kind of running them, running off poor fit clients who don't have the ability to pay. Mm -hmm. But if I underprice it, I'm stuck with a client. I don't know, you know, like who knows when this is going to be done and I end mm -hmm. up making $2 an hour. Right. So, I mean, it, we've been going a little long. This has been great, I, but I do need to respect everybody's time, including your own. Jonathan, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you for doing this. You've mentioned your daily mailing list. I am on that. It is something where I, as much as I want to hit respond on every email that comes <laughs> in, I have resisted many times. I've started something. I was like, no, I actually need to get some work done. But- <laughs> How can Dear Listener get on the list and where else can we find you? Yeah, just go to valuepricingbootcamp.com and you'll get redirected to my site. It's, I think, easier to spell than my name. So yeah, if you go to valuepricingbootcamp.com, it'll redirect you to my site. And if if you want to learn more about value pricing, it's just one way to fix price. There's there's like three or four that I recommend, but that's how to, how to do custom projects. That's a great place to start. And as you said, people reply to my emails every day. I get I read them all. I get back to everybody one way or another, whether it's a group email or a specific one. But yeah, jump on there and start a conversation. I'd love to hear more about the kinds of challenges lawyers face. I'm sure there's some regulations too that I'm not aware of. But yeah, I like to I like to investigate other industries that I'm not as familiar with to kind of broaden the base. I mean, my mission is to rid the world of hourly billing, I, starting with software developers, but I'm not stopping there. Good. Well, we will have links to Value Pricing Bootcamp in the show notes. Thanks so much for being with us. My pleasure. Thanks so much for listening. You can find more info on us and get your free white paper on client service at fivestarcouncil.com. You can get in touch with me at john at fivestarcouncil.com. If you enjoyed the podcast, please subscribe wherever fine podcasts are found and leave us a review wherever you can. 